You're listening to The Blatino Nerd. Uncut, uncensored, unfiltered. Get dirty and keep it nerdy. Hello, members of the Nerd Herd, and welcome to the Blatino Nerd. In today's episode, we are going to pay tribute to a former touring giant, what what was probably the biggest event of our generation. I am talking, of course, about the Warp Tour. As you guys know, the Warp Tour was laid to rest after its final show in Atlantic City last year, and this is the first year in 25 years that we do not have a warp tour and today's episode i'm going to delve in to the history of the warp tour and some of my favorite moments and a little bit of my personal history with the warp tour and just some of the good memories the bad memories the ones that may be kind of hazy because maybe I was in an altered state of mind, but memories nonetheless. And hopefully, as you listen to this episode, you will reflect with me as I've had the pleasure to attend numerous warp tours over the years. And <clears throat> many with you out there listening. Quite a few of you, actually. But before I get into that, I'd like to talk to the men. However, the women can join in on this conversation because I'm sure you're going to listen anyway. But I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. You know what a woman's ultimate kink is? Aftercare. Aftercare. Men, it's hot. You work a lot. The weather's been unbearable. Whether you're outside on a job or you're working or your lady just wants to get a little close. You don't want to be all smelly and stinky and hot. Unless, of course, it's from doing the deed. Then you want to be a little sweaty. But anyway, I got the cure here for you. My buddies over at the Ballsy Company have got your sack. They have many, many, many wonderful men's care products, a lot of which I use myself because, you know, I'm a larger guy. Everything sweats. I need to, you know, feel fresh. And with these products, you're getting the absolute best. There's no bullshit ingredients in it. Nothing that you can't pronounce. It's just the highest quality natural ingredients to formulate the perfect wash for your most odor-prone and sensitive areas. Helping you maintain a flawless sack while leaving your entire body feeling fresher, longer. We have ingredients like charcoal, aloe vera, coconut oil, cucumber peel extract, cedar wood, lavender oil. Helps fight acne, soothes dry skin, has an anti-inflammatory, and smells really good. I know a lot of you have just relied on soap and water for the old rod and tackle, but don't you think that the little guy deserves more? I know I do. And I'm sure the ladies will appreciate it as well. And the beautiful thing about this, women, is that you can use this too. It gets a little sweaty under the uh, under the chesticles. You want to take care of those as well. You know, I understand it, they get a little itchy and irritable. You can use this too. You have a liquid powder. Rub it right in. Give it 30 seconds. You'll be feeling fresh as a daisy in no time. I know what you're saying. This is such a wonderful thing. I'd like to have this. Well, good news. Your buddy, the nerd, is going to hook you up. Right now, at ballwash.com, if you use the code word BLATINO, that's B-L-A-T-I-N-O, just like the name of the podcast, it gives you 20% off your order. That's a whole 20%. That's a hell of a savings, and it goes a long way. You can either make a one-time purchase 
or join the subscription. Get it every month or so. I'm telling you, you won't regret it. It's ballsy. Keep the funk off your junk. Now, going back into the mega giant that was the Warp Tour. As I stated at the beginning of the episode, that this is the first year since its formation in 1995 where there is no Warp Tour. And it's sad because, you know, it's not even COVID related. This is just last year, well, back in 2018, founder Kevin Lyman decided that, you know, it was no longer financially or economically viable to continue as a full tour. Instead, the 2019 installment was just a giant festival down in Atlantic City. I myself couldn't make it for circumstances out of my control, but I know a bunch of people went and it was a good time. I myself was sad because I've had the pleasure of attending eight warp tours in my lifetime. And, um... It's it's going to be missed. And as I said, I'm going to delve in to the history of the Warp Tour a bit. For the listeners at home who now have little ones who will never get to experience it, or if you've had the misfortune of having never attended one in your lifetime, I am sorry. And I hope that one day you get to experience the euphoric and wonderful time that was Warped Tour. Wasn't always fun. Well, correction, it was always real, it was always fun, but it wasn't always real fun, and I'm going to get into that as well. But, here we go. Warped Tour was conceived by Kevin Lyman in 1995, and his original plan for it was to actually be an alternative rock festival, as opposed to as we know it now, where different genres were always on display. And it's funny, the very first Warp Tour had like bands like Deftones, No Doubt, Face to Face, No Use for a Name, Sick of It All, Sublime, The Swing and Others. And it the first year went went pretty well, but then The next year, Kevin decided he was going to be a bit more inclusive of the punk rock scene as well as the emerging, you know, as hip hop had started to become a big part of that, like that scene, like underground hip hop and whatnot. So the following year, on top of uh, Siv, who had performed the previous year and face to face, along with Fluff, were joined by the likes of 311, The Alcoholics, Blink-182, Beck, Fishbone, and even the Mighty Mighty Boston's Mushroom Head and Real Big Fish. And this was where the Warp Tour, as we know it, really started to take off. And for the first few years, it... uh. The first few years, it continued mostly with the punk rock and ska scene with a little splash of hip hop here and there. But as time went on and trends started to change, Kevin adapted to it, which for the older Warped Tour crowd didn't go over so well at first, whereas the new people who were getting to experience it was like, okay, cool. So this is a little bit of everything. And as time progressed, more more and more hip-hop, punk rock, even R&B and pop singers started joining the Warped Tour. And before you know it, what started as like an alternative rock and punk rock show later just became a music showcase for all to enjoy. And various acts and artists over the years have performed, like Incubus, Linkin Park, The Used, Eminem, D12. I believe even Esham and Twisted 
have performed on Warped Tour. Um, and it definitely was a big, big, I guess I want to say foot through the door for, you know, bigger bands, Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, Motion City Soundtrack, Yellow Card, even Joan Jett, The Offspring, and Billy Idol have all been on Warped Tour. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in 2007, even Katy Perry was on the Warped Tour. I only remember that because Family Force 5, who I was really, really, really into and always will be into, and they were such a great band. If you've never listened to them, after this is over, on whatever app you're using to listen to, unless you're listening to something that specifically only plays podcasts, but if you're listening to this on Spotify or Pandora or TuneIn or any of those, check out Family Force 5. It, I can't guarantee all of you will like it, but the music was just so fun. And that's why I like it. I have a lot of good memories with really, really good people based around the music of Family Force 5. But anyway, over the years, Warp Tour grew and grew and went from a five or six show festival to this massive summer long event that stretched out from the US to Canada and even had a few festivals overseas and pretty much anybody who was anybody during that phase and that era of music has played Warp Tour now the festival hasn't been without its fair share of controversies you know there were older bands who didn't like the new direction, so to say, of Warped Tour, you know, bands who were getting kicked off. Uh, I believe the most controversial one being Front Porch Step, who had all those sexual assault allegations against him. Honestly, I don't really know whatever came of the allegations. I don't know if he's in any kind of trouble or if he was uh, convicted. or. But I know that was one of the biggest warp controversies where there were bands refusing like to straight up play any dates that front porch stuff was on and it also led to people accusing kevin lyman of booking him on the show anyway just because he was desperate for money which you know kevin had to defend himself from these uh these uh ridiculous claims why can't i say they're ridiculous because like i said i don't know what came of the whole thing but I know uh, there was another another really, really famous incident where bands were... I know uh, the Queers, uh, their vocalist, Joe Queer, was against bands like Fall Out Boy playing because he felt that like the newer generation of bands like Yellow Card, Fall Out Boy, Atreyu, Darkest Hour, all those guys reminded him of the jocks he hated in high school. And he thought that the Warped Tour should keep that punk rock aesthetic. And it was a sentiment he also shared with uh, Keith Morris of the Sokol Jerks, who pretty much had the same... who pretty much had the same belief. They felt that, like, the Warped Tour should keep a more punk rock kind of, you know, small hole in the wall intimate kind of feel whereas they felt it was getting to be uh, I believe the vocalist of the matches used the term dog and pony show which you know I, I don't get I I understand you know if you were fortunate enough to attend the first four or five years of the Warp Tour I'm sure if you're listening you may have felt that way if you didn't awesome if you did I totally get it but yeah, it just it every year they always added new twists and like new surprise artists or that you wouldn't expect to see on the warp tour. And quite a few times they were the ones who got like the most surprising crowds. Like the crowds were like massive and huge and I remember I believe in oh eight I went with a friend of mine. I went with a few friends of mine, but specifically my friend Emma, if you're listening. Hello, Emma. 
her and I were really excited for Oreska Band, which is the ska band out of Japan. And another here's another band recommendation for you guys, Oreska Band. And their music is just so much like ska, bouncy, and just all around having a good time. And I remember her and I being really, really excited to see them. And everybody else we went with, they were like, uh... Okay, well, we don't know who they are. And another friend of mine was like, look, they're a fucking ska band. If they're a ska, I'm here for some ska. I'm going to watch with you guys. And I remember us going there. Warped Tour 08 was just a, was a huge year for ska bands, honestly. It was like, or a ska band, Real Big Fish, Mighty Mighty Boston's, I believe Streetlight Manifesto played. Um... I think Folly did the one Jersey show, uh, Voodoo Glow Skulls. I remember 08 being such a huge year for Ska. And I was like, that was, I believe, not the last year I got to go, but that was the last year where I remember looking at the lineup and thinking, yes. And I didn't go in later years, and it's not so much that like I didn't like the bands that were on the bill. It just, you know, by then I had already, I guess, started adulting. I was already working full-time jobs. Um, I believe just four years after that work tour, I was married and had Haley on the way. So as work tour went on, I uh, became an adult. So, yeah. But I remember my very first warp tour. The very first warp tour I attended was in 2002. And my mom originally told me that I couldn't go. And this is the first time I'm telling this story because now I'm in my 30s and I really feel like there's really nothing that can be done about it now. <laughs> But I went to my first warp Tour in 2002. And originally, I was told I couldn't go. And, you know, naturally, it's because in 2002, I was 12, maybe 13. So my mom naturally was like, well, if I can't be there with you, I really don't think you should be going. And I was, you know, I was unhappy with it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Okay, mom, I won't go. You know, that whole spiel, that, that whole bullshit. But I had some friends. And my friends were always looking out for me. And they had an extra ticket. And they were like, yo, so we're going to Warp Tour and we got an extra ticket, and we'd like for you to go. And I was like, um, I already asked my mom, and she said no. And my friends were like, you actually asked your mom? No. They were like, dude, we told our moms that we're going to be at your house all weekend. And I'm like, oh, well, fucking great. But long story short, we all ended up taking a, we took, a bus and like a series of trains into Warp Tour in 2002. And the lineup in 2002 was, I believe back then it was uh, Bad Religion, Flogging Molly, Good Charlotte, MXPX, Newfound Glory, Real Big Fish, Thursday, NERD, that I remember, NERD, uh, Alkaline Trio, Mighty Mighty Boss Zones, the used glass jaw. This was like when the used had really just come out and like the taste of ink was pretty much unless you bought the album, the taste of ink was like the only used song anyone knew. And I remember going and somehow word never got out that we made it to work tour. Um, my friend's parents never called my mom. My mom didn't call them. So she just, you know, assumed that we were all at, we were all at this kid's house for the weekend, and, you know, that happened. And then I went again in 2003, and 
one of the uh, one of the groups playing was Jurassic Five, who is if you guys have never heard of them, it's uh, they're a rap group and they're very reminiscent of the old like mid to late '80s rap sound where you get like four or five MCs in a group together on the same song. And fun fact about Jurassic Five, my cousin Mark, who goes by the name Mark Seven, is a member of Jurassic Five. So, yes, I'm a big, big Jurassic Five fan. Not just because of my cousin, but be you know because I like that style of rap. I'm an old school rap guy. I like all time, ty- like all types of music. But my knowledge of '80s and '90s rap has wild people older than me of people from that era including my stepdad how the fuck did you know that and i mean if you want an example i'm I'm gonna throw some names at you i grew up on i grew up mostly on duck down records so that was like helter skelter original gun clappers uh boot camp click Smith and Wesson, who went by the name Coco Brothers for a while before changing their name back to Smith and Wesson. Big Smith and Wesson fan. Uh, again, original original Gun Clappers, which The Shining is one of the greatest rap albums of all time. If you've never listened to it, I strongly urge that you do. Um, yeah, growing up, I was big, big Sean Price fan. Rest in peace, Sean Price, a.k.a. Mike Tyson. That's Mike, M-I-C. But yeah, um, and Sean Price is probably one of the greatest rappers you've never heard of. Do some research. Do your Googles. Um, or actually, fun fact: you can just play Grand Theft Auto Three. If you listen to Game Radio, you already know which song I'm referring to. It's the one song on Game Radio everyone knows word for word. Yes, that is Sean Price. Anyway, getting off track here. Um, so yeah, then it started becoming a regular thing. As I got older, I was able to just freely attend Warp Tour. And my favorite Warp Tour, one of my favorite Warp Tour memories was in Warp Tour 05, which before I get to that, I would like to tell you guys about something really cool coming up. Yes, yes, yes. This is really, really awesome, and I'm really excited, and I'm really excited for you guys to see it. The North Star Theater Company is doing a virtual Disney cabaret. Yes, on July 31st and August 1st, come watch myself and over 40 other performers perform some of your favorite Disney classics. The event takes place over two nights and features... Classics from such favorites as Hercules, Frozen, Moana, Tangled, Toy Story, Mulan, and so many, many more. It is guaranteed to be the coolest event of the summer. And you can watch it for free in the comfort of your own home. That is Disney Classics, a virtual cabaret by the North Star Theater Company. That is this Friday, July 31st, and Saturday, August 1st at 7 p.m. on YouTube. If you would like more info about the event, I will have it on my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages. Check it out. You won't want to miss it. I promise. So back in 2005... I managed to go to Warp Tour in Asbury Park, which is the first Warp Tour I remember actually having to like cut my time at other bands short because another band I wanted to see was playing. And it was tough because like I was so out of breath and I remember the weather that day being like it was like ninety-eight degrees. Uh, boy band puns. Anyway, um, so it was like 98 degrees, and I remember getting there just as Darkest Hour had started playing. So Darkest Hour was my first band of the day. That was who I had wanted to see. And 
like literally within 15 minutes of the gates opening, they were on stage. So, uh, me, my friends, Kayla, and Brandy, and my friend Kristen. Wow, yeah, that was a that was a great, great, great show. We uh, pretty much hauled ass, and right as you know, darkest hour was starting. I'm in the pit no more than three minutes, and I get hit, and all of a sudden, there's just something doesn't feel right. I'm getting this pain in my jaw. It was, like, unbearable. But at the time, it was so hot, and, and like, adrenaline had kicked in, and I still, holding my mouth... Enjoyed the entire set of Darkest Hour. Then darted across to see Atreyu. And about 15 minutes into Atreyu set, Motion City Soundtrack had started playing. So I made my business to go see them. Then we ran over to Fall Out Boy. And then My Chemical Romance. And I believe Silverstein, The Used. We got to see all of it. And finally, around 10 o'clock, 10 or 11 o'clock, I get home and something doesn't feel right. So I'm up in the middle of the night and I'm like in tears because my face hurts. Um, I go to the hospital and discover that my jaw had been broken. My jaw was broken by the very first hit I took in the pit. But because I had spent all that money already and I am such a fucking glutton for punishment or a trooper, whatever you want to call it, I uh, went ahead and enjoyed the rest of my day. And it was worth the four weeks that I sounded like Kanye West. Worth it, but do not recommend. Do not recommend. That was fucking painful. Um, And over the years, I got to enjoy... Many, many other warp Tours with a bunch of great friends, and I've made some great memories. Like, here's another story that my parents are probably just hearing for the first time, and um, I'm going to apologize in advance, but really nothing you can do about it now, because it was 2007, and here we are in 2020. Just saying. Um, I was with a friend of mine who, for... The purposes of her identity and what she does, I'm going to keep her name anonymous. I'm going to leave her out of it. Well, her name, but she's a terrible part of the story. We um, actually met up with a connect of mine. Yes, I uh, used to be a pothead in my day. And we, uh, I asked if, you know, he could hook us up. So, I told him, you know, we were going to Warp Tour, and he goes, ha there's only one way to enjoy Warp Tour, and, you know, gave me at least half an ounce. So, I was like, bro, I'm not going to fucking smoke all this. So, my friend was like, who said we had to smoke it? And I was like, huh? So, she goes, it's Warp Tour. It's hot as hell. A fucking bottle of water is like $32. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? And I'm like, yo, yes, yes. So we fucking drive in the warp tour, half an ounce of weed in our trunk. And we fucking, we're right outside. We get to the show like two hours before it starts. So, you know. Thing is with Warp Tour back then, especially you know in the peak days of the scene, you could fucking tell who smoked weed and who did a little more hardcore shit. But you could always tell who smoked weed. So we went there. We you know we picked our audience and we were like, "Yo, um, so like, you know, what's up?" So we fucking were sitting outside with practically tailgating Warp Tour. And we get there three hours before the show starts. And I want to say we had sold all of it about 
45 minutes before the show started. So now we've got a bunch of people going in the Warped Tour, high out of the fucking minds, myself included. Um, and we're just getting ready to go have a fucking blast. And because, you know, we were mostly there to see Family Force 5. If you guys have, again, never heard of Family Force 5, if you check out some of their music videos on YouTube, they wear these really, really, like, ridiculous over-the-top outfits. And they're not, like, over-the-top because they're not, like, they're not, like, over-the-top in the sense that, like, they're dressed like professional wrestlers or Power Rangers. But they're dressed in things that, like, if you were to go out in public... Unless you knew who they were, you'd be like, yo, what the hell are those guys wearing? So, one day, a uh, my friend and I decided we would raid the local thrift shop. And we're like, we need to get Family Force 5 approved attire. So, my mother goes, what the fuck does that mean? So, we show her the videos for Country Gentlemen, uh... Love Addict, which is like their their big, big single. That's the one song where even if you've never heard of them, you may have heard Love Addict in passing on numerous occasions. But, um, yeah, it was, so we, uh, we found some stuff and I bought like this bright ass pink dress shirt. I mean like bright pink. It was more of like a peach, but it definitely most people definitely will look at it and be like, "Why are you wearing a pink shirt?" And like these fucking like golf pants, and not like if I were wearing them, I would look like a golfer. No, these were legitimate fucking golf pants, like checkered and everything. So here I am in these tight ass nut hugging golf pants. With this peach dress shirt and fucking all white chucks and warp tour. And this was when I had this weird style trend, and some of my friends thought it was funny, and then some of my friends it just straight up pissed them off. Well, I had glasses in them with no lenses. So I would just wear these fucking rims around my face. So here I am with peach shirt golf pants, bright ass chucks, and lensless glasses. Looking like I robbed, pretty much looking like I mugged Tiger Woods in Dexter's laboratory. That's that's what I'm going to call that. That's That was the fashion chic. And under the peach shirt, I had a shirt that had a date on it, which I believe was July 23rd. I have to go back because there's a picture of me wearing the shirt. There's a picture of me wearing that t-shirt, which I'll post on my Facebook page and my Twitter if you guys want to see it, because I do still have possession of it, which was promoting Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the book, which at that point hadn't come out yet. So the t-shirt just had the date, and then it said, who will die? So when I took the shirt off, half of the people at Warped Tour were like, oh, shit. Someone's going to die in the new Harry Potter book. And then other people were like, yo, new Harry Potter book. And one girl like walked up to me and it was apparently her birthday and she knew nothing about Harry Potter. And she asked if I was being threatening. And she was like, that's my fucking birthday. Are you trying to tell me something? And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to tell you that that's when the new Harry Potter book comes out. Get the fuck out of my face. I'm high and I'm trying to listen to Family Force 5 and vibe. As a matter of fact, I'm on my way to see Kerry, like Katy Perry and you're fucking... All my vibes up right now. Get out of here. Skedaddle. So, you know, I chased her off. And um, actually a really cool fact. Uh, my friend and I were, we actually signed up to be organ donors. And we gave blood because they were also holding a blood drive that year. So as a result of it, we actually got to hang out with Craig Owens before he took the stage with Cinematic Sunrise. Well, you guys remember Cinematic Sunrise? He actually performed twice that day, once with Chiodos and twice with Cinematic Sunrise. And because, you know, we were organ donors and donated blood that day, we actually got to hang out with him like 15, 20 minutes before the set. And if you guys have never had the pleasure of meeting Craig Owens, he 
is like the nicest guy ever. Incredible vocalist. Like his range is phenomenal and his screams are almost ungodly. But the music videos are misleading. In music videos, he seems like this very, very small guy. And then you meet him and he's like seven feet fucking tall. Like he fucking towers over everybody. So much so that he had to sit on the ground to take a picture with me because even kneeling down, he was still taller than I was. So I had to kneel and he had to sit on the ground and realize Craig Owens was this fucking tall until then. And I remember trying to look at the tattoo on his neck and I was like, does he have a fucking swan tattooed on his neck? So he just turns around and he goes, swan. If you get that reference, kudos. And it just, it fucking tickled me. It was so good. And you know, like I said, we got to hang out with him. He thanked us for donating blood. And, you know, he asked us how we were liking the show so far. And he goes, like, are you guys here for Chiodos or are you guys here for Sin Sun? And I was like, um, I'm actually a big fan of both, but I would definitely choose Chiodos over Sin Sun. And he goes, man, no one ever fucking picks Sin Sun. Now I'm disappointed. And that was one of, that was probably one of the highlights of my day. The second was when I finally got to meet Family Force 5. So I'm talking to them and they go... How uh, so? How did you hear about Family Force Five? What do you know about us? And this is me trying to imitate their accent because they're southern as all hell. So the drummer. So if you guys don't know about Family Force Five, they are actually a set of twins. Well, at the time they were. They are. They've since disbanded. But they were a set of twins, a third brother, and like two childhood friends. So there was like the guitarist, the bassist, the drummer, the guitarist, the bassist, the drummer, the vocalist, and the guitarist. They had a guitarist, and his guitar was the dopest thing ever in the world to me. So I went up to him, and the drummer is like, "Hey, what's up? How you guys doing? Did you see Katy Perry yet?" And we're like, "No." He goes, "Good, because she hasn't performed." And it would be really, really cool if you saw Katy Perry. And, you know, at the time, I think, like, I Kissed a Girl had just come out. So she was still, like, relatively new. But they were trying, you know, they were going to push us to go see Katy Perry. And I was like, well, if Family Force 5 wants me to go see Katy Perry, I'm going to go see Katy Perry. And I was really, really determined to see Katy Perry because they asked me to. So then they asked, you know, well, how'd you hear about the band? What do you know about Family Force 5? And I was like, well, I saw you guys on CD USA, where I know all of you are listening. And what the fuck is CD USA? CD USA came on back in the days. Direct TV had its own special like channel that you only got if you were a Direct TV subscriber. And CD USA was like their version of TRL. They would play a few music videos and then they would get like random artists to perform. That's actually how I was introduced to quite a few bands that I listened to at the time. But Family Force 5 stuck out the most to me because they performed Love Addict and I thought that that was the sickest thing ever. I had never heard like a song go through so many genres in just two and a half minutes. And I was just like... I was hooked immediately. So I remember finding out that their album was out and I bought the album and I put it on my iPod. And back in those days, I was a mall rat. Big, big mall rat. One day I planned to get all, most, as many of my mall rat friends as I can. And we're just going to have a round table discussion for an episode because I have so many mall rat stories. And I think that you guys would appreciate it. But I have so many, so many great friends and my closest friends I have because of Willowbrook Mall in New Jersey. And there are just so many good times there. But anyway, back to my days at Willowbrook Mall. I was known as the kid with the boombox. I 
always had a boombox with me. And it either played CDs or when I got the money and uh, kind of glowed up a bit, I got the one that played and charged your iPod. So I would buy mad D batteries because these things would eat these, like, it would eat these batteries up. So, you know, I used to shop at the FYE and Rollerbrook so much that the people in there, whenever they got something, like, whenever they got something they knew I'd be interested in, they would just put it on the counter and be like, yo, check this out. And I'm like, okay. So I would listen. And I'm like, let me get a copy of that on CD. Go home, put it in my iPod. I would walk around Willowbrook and Funny Games with my boombox blasting whatever the newest music was. So I remember sitting out there and the kick at the time I had Family Force 5 blasting. And this was when Crank That had just hit. So I would switch back and forth between Family Force 5 and Crank That Soldier Boy. Uh, and one of my funny memories of Rollerbrook is that I taught a bunch of people how to crank that outside of fun and games. And we had about 15, 20 people learning how to crank that. And then security came and broke us up because, you know, that's what they like to do. That's what they're there for, I guess. But I would sit outside and blast Family Force 5. And the more I played it, the more people got hooked. So it became a thing when... It'd be me, my friend Emma, her cousin, my other friend who shall not be named. I have no beef with her. I love her. It's just because this story has direct reference to drugs and because of what she does for a living, I just, you know, I'm leaving her name out of it. But I still love her to death. And she's still a very good friend of mine. She is actually how Erica and I met. So she is probably the biggest piece in this puzzle that is my life. Because she is directly responsible for the meeting of my wife and I. So, yeah. Love you, girl. And if you're listening, keep it nerdy. Um, so, yeah. I, I got a bunch of friends hooked on Family Force 5. And it got to the point where when I got to work and finally wanted to see them, I had enough people with me that we were like, yeah, we're going to go see Family Force 5. So then... I told them about the USA, uh, the CD USA thing, and the lead singer goes, "Wow, CD USA! Someone dug that up out of the grave." And I'm like, "I've been following you guys ever since." So I told them the story about how I knew that, like, their dad was like an evangelist, and, and they were like, "How do you know all that?" And I was like, "Bro, I know what I like." Even they were amazed at what I knew, and I was like, "Bro, I know what I know." When I say I'm a fan of you guys. I mean it. So then the bassist comes up, who's one of the twins, and he goes, man, those are some sick pants. Talking about my uh, my golf pants. And I was like, you, you really like them? And he was like, yo, those are dope. And I was like, um, do you want them? And he goes, I don't think you can take off your pants at Warp Tour. I'm pretty sure you're going to get in some kind of trouble. And I was like, no, I've got basketball shorts in my backpack, like, I am prepared. I was like, because these are kind of chafing my balls. So they all started laughing. And I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that they're a Christian band. Great. Now they think I'm some kind of fucking heathen. But they were like, no, that's really funny. So I was like, I'll go change it to the basketball shorts. And if you'd like, you can have the pants. And he goes, I, if you don't mind. I'm like, no, I do not mind. So I gave... The basis, the basis, the basis. Fatty. They all had really, really fun nicknames. I, you know, I gave them my pants, and we took a bunch of pictures. And with those, I have those pictures still. I will post them up. And this was 2007, so this is 19 year old me with the members of Family Force Five, and I am halfway stoned out of my mind and also ecstatic. But you couldn't tell from the pictures. The pictures. Like, make it look like I'm having a miserable time. But it was a combination of I needed water. It was really hot. And I was still kind of high. So the pictures of just me with, like, this really weird look on my face. But I was actually having the best day of my life. And long story short, we never got to see Katy Perry. Because as we read the schedule, we found out Coheed and Cambria was playing at the same time. So... 
Coheed and Cambria won that one very easily. I did never get to see Katy Perry, but I heard that she was one of the highlights of the Warp Tour that year. And yeah, and I was just I was still coming down from seeing and meeting Family Force Five. And there were some other great acts that year. I also got to meet I also got to meet Ronnie Radke, who was still with Escape the Fate at the time. They were actually one of the headliners. I believe the last two bands of the night were Escape the Fate and the Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. Yeah, the Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. There's another blast from the past. Early 2000 emo was so fucking great. But I digress. But yeah, we saw Escape the Fate, Red Jumpsuit Apparatus, and that was just... um. There was also a... There was also a point in the day where I potentially could have gotten into a fight. Among the group of people that I was with, it's my buddy Big Rich. I know Rich is listening. What's up, Rich? It was my buddy Big Rich. It was, again, my friend who should not be named. Uh, strangely enough, Nick, who also provides the theme song that you hear, you know, the vocalist of Hit Like a Girl. They and I were best friends back then. We're still really, really good friends, but we were best friends back then. And so it was me, Big Rich, Nick, Emma, I forget who else, but there was this one kid there who apparently had met me once and didn't like me. I, I wouldn't have known this kid from a can of paint. But um, fortunately, well, unfortunately for him, he also happened to know Big Rich. So him and Big Rich are talking. They're having a beer. And he's talking about, oh, this kid, Jordan's here, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, like, racial slurs up the ass. I, and I, I'm listening to him. Uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's here with Jordan. She was like, she's here with some Jordan. I met him once. Uh I told him I'm going to beat that nigger's ass when I see him and blah, 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 blah. And have you seen him? He was like, he's probably the only nigger walking around warp Tour. So Rich was like, were for real? And then he just turns around. He goes, hey, yo, Jordan. And all of a sudden I come forward. And when I tell you this guy's ghost, this guy's soul probably left his body before he started running. And Rich just goes, yo, the next time you talk shit. Next time you talk shit about my boy Jordan, you should just know that that's who I'm here with, son. And if you got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. And I was like, nah, Rich, don't worry about it, man. I was like, I appreciate you, but don't worry about it. And it was just, it was such a wild day. And it still remains one of the, uh, one of the uh, highlights of my life and one of the highlights of the Warp Tour. And, you know, last year was what was, to my understanding, the final Warp Tour. So rather than just do a big tour, they did a two-day festival down in Atlantic City where I knew a bunch of people who got to go, and I've heard it was a great time. But I got to miss out on it. Now, I've heard rumors that they plan to bring the Warp Tour back in some capacity in the future. While I'm not holding my breath... I uh, I do have, you know, some kind of hope that the next generation will have close to what we had. And I have so many just fond memories of friends and music and just good times that were had because of the work tour. And I know a lot of people. And I've got to meet a lot of great people and discover so many of my favorite bands because of Warp Tour. And I would like to thank, even though he may never hear this, I would like to thank Kevin Lyman for the brainchild of his that has allowed me and millions of other people my age, older and younger, that just have so many great memories attached to. Warp Tour. And again, I, I hope to see Warp Tour in the future. 
But if this is where it ends, then it was a great run. And I am thankful that I got to experience it. And if you're listening and you got to experience it, um, if you'd like, leave some of your favorite memories on the Blatino Nerd page. Leave them in the comment section. Let's talk about it. I want to hear some of your stories. And to the Warp Tour itself, thank you. Thank you for being a launching pad for so many great bands and so many kids who discovered their favorite bands because of it. Thank you so much for the memories and you will be missed. So passes a gallant vessel. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Blatino Nerd. And as always, thank you to Hit Like a Girl for providing this always wonderful, wonderful song, Breathe You In, which is on the album What Makes Love Last, which is available on all streaming platforms. As always, thank you for listening to the Blatino Nerd. I will catch you all on the next one. And as always, keep it nerdy. See you around, nerd herd.